Hello and welcome to Lee Algebras. In today's lecture, lecture number three, we will talk about finite dimensional SL2 modules. Let's meet the main protagonists of this lecture. We start with the Lie algebra SL2. Throughout the whole lecture, we work over the field C of complex numbers. The Lie algebra SL2, which is a shorthand for SL2C, is defined as a special linear Lie algebra over the complex vector space C upper 2, which is a standard two-dimensional complex vector space consisting of column vectors with two coordinates. Fixing a standard basis in this vector space, we can identify SL2 with the Lie algebra of all traceless 2 times 2 complex matrices. The following three elements form a standard basis in SL2. The element F, which is a matrix unit E21, it has 1 in the intersection of the second row and the first column, and 0 everywhere else. The diagonal element H, which has 1 and minus 1 on the diagonal, Note that SL2 consists of traceless matrices, therefore the trace of H must be zero. And finally, the element E, which is a matrix unit E12, it has one in the intersection of the first row and the second column, and zero everywhere else. We record the following three Lie bracket relations in SL3. So the Lie bracket of H and E, it is the same as the commutator of H and E, because in the Lie algebra SL2, the Lie bracket is the commutator of matrices, or linear operators. So the commutator of H and E is equal to 2E, the commutator of H and F is equal to minus 2F, and the commutator of E and F is equal to H. So these three equalities can be checked using direct matrix computation. Please note that these three equalities completely determine the Lie bracket on the Lie algebra SL2. The Lie algebra SL2 has dimension 3, so the Lie bracket is completely determined by the bracket of the basis elements, and these are nine brackets. But the diagonal Diagonal brackets, when we bracket basis element with itself, must be zero because of anti-commutativity. And then our three qualities determine three of the remaining six brackets, and the remaining three brackets can be obtained from these using anti-commutativity. So the commutator of E and H is equal to minus 2E and so on. So this, in principle, determines completely the Lie bracket on our Lie algebra SL2. Let us talk about finite dimensional SL2 modules. In this lecture, we denote a finite dimensional SL2 module. To simplify our notation, we denote by capital F the linear operator on V, which describes the action of the element small f of the Lie algebra SL2. Similarly, we denote by capital H the linear operator which describes the action on V of the element little h from SL2, and by capital E, the linear operator on V which describes the action of the element small e. So the aim of the lecture is to classify all simple finite dimensional SL2 modules, to give an explicit construction of all simple finite dimensional SL2 modules, and to prove a complete reducibility theorem that is a statement that every finite dimensional SL2 module is isomorphic to a direct sum of simple modules. This property is usually referred to that every finite dimensional SL2 module is semi simple. In the language of representations, one says that every finite dimensional representation of SL2 is completely reducible. So therefore, this is usually called a complete reducibility theorem. So these are the main aims of the lecture. Let us start with construction of simple finite dimensional SL2 modules. We fix a non-negative integer n and denote by V upper n the vector space of dimension n plus 1, which has the basis consisting of the following elements. So we have the elements V indexed by minus n, minus n plus 2, minus n plus 4, and so on up to n. There are exactly n plus 1 elements listed in this basis. So now we are going to define our linear operators capital F, H, and E, which will describe the action of our elements little f, little h, and little e from our Lie algebra SL2 on the module Vn. The action of F is defined in the following way. The element F kills 
the basis element V minus N, and then shifts all other basis elements to the previous one. So F maps V minus N plus 2 to V minus N, it maps V minus N plus 4 to V minus N plus 2, and so on. The linear operator H acts diagonally in this basis. So for this linear operator, each basis vector VI is an eigenvector with eigenvalue I. So this basis, which we start with, it's an eigenbasis for H. And finally, the linear operator E kills the element Vn, and then it shifts all other elements to the right with some scalar coefficient. So it sends the element Vn minus 2 to n times Vn. E sends the basis element Vn minus 4 to 2n minus 1, Vn minus 2, and so on. In general, E sends the basis element Vi to the scalar multiple of the basis element Vi plus 2 with the scalar given by this expression, n plus i plus 2 times n minus 1 divided by 4. So this can be depicted using the following picture. So we have our basis elements. Our basis is an eigenbasis for H. So we have the orange arrows which preserve the elements and then the number on the arrow shows you the coefficient with which the element, the corresponding element acts. So H is an orange element. It acts on Vn with coefficient n, on Vn minus 2 with coefficient n minus 2 and so on. F is a magenta element. So so it maps Vn to Vn minus 2 with coefficient 1, Vn minus 2 to Vn minus 4 with coefficient 1, and so on. And E is a blue element, so it maps Vn to 0, it maps Vn minus 2 to n times Vn, it maps Vn minus 4 to 2 times n minus 1, Vn minus 2, and so on. So this is a picture which completely describes the action of elements F, H, and E on our module Vn. The claim Vn is a simple SL2 module. So here we have two claims. Claim number one, Vn is an SL2 module. Claim number two, the SL2 module Vn is a simple module. So let's start with an argument for the claim number one. To prove that Vn is an SL2 module, we need to check the Lie bracket relation when applied to each basis element Vi of our module Vn. So we will check the Lie bracket relations when applied to the basis element Vn, and all others can be checked similar. So the first relation is that the commutator of E and F is equal to H. By definition, H Vn is N Vn. So Vn is an eigenvector for H h with eigenvalue n. By definition, E kills Vn, so Ef minus Fe applied to Vn is the same as Ef applied to Vn. F maps Vn to Vn minus 2, and E shifts it back with coefficient n, so the first relation is checked. The second relation is that the commutator of h and E is equal to 2E. This is an easy relation because E kills Vn, so the right-hand side is just 0. In the left-hand side, the first summon kills it directly because E kills Vn. And the second summand, so we have minus E H V N, H sends V N to N times V N, and then E kills V N. So we again have zero. Finally, we have the relation that the commutator of H and F is equal to minus 2F. So the right-hand side, minus 2F applied to Vn, is minus 2 times Vn minus 2, because F just maps Vn to Vn minus 2. In the left-hand side, in the first summand, F maps Vn to Vn minus 2, and H maps Vn minus 2 to N minus 2 times Vn minus 2. So each basis element is an eigenvector for H, with eigenvalue its index. So for the second summand, h vn is n vn, and then f sends vn to vn minus 2. So when we put this together, we will get minus 2 times vn minus 2 exactly as it was necessary. So this computation shows that vn, as defined on the previous slide, is indeed an SL2 module. So now we have to prove the second claim of the theorem, that this SL2 module is simple. To establish simplicity, we will use the fact that the standard basis of Vn consists of eigenvectors for H with different eigenvalues. In other words, that H has simple spectrum on the vector space Vn. Assume that W is a non-zero submodule of Vn. Then it's a finite dimensional space, stable under the action of H, so it must contain an eigenvector of H. Since the spectrum of H is simple, the 
this eigenvector should be up to a non-zero scalar multiple, one of our VIs. So in particular, it follows that W must contain one of the VIs. Using the action of F, we obtained that it must contain VI minus two and so on, all the way down to V minus F. Using the action of E, we obtained that W must contain VI plus two, VI plus four, and all the way up to VF. These two facts are due to the observation that if we go to the previous slide, all coefficients of F are non-zero all the way down to V minus N. And similarly, all coefficients of E are also non-zero all the way up to Vn. So in particular, it follows that W must contain the standard basis of Vn, and so it must coincide with Vn. So the module Vn constructed in the previous slide is indeed a simple SL2 module of dimension n plus 1. Before we can discuss classification of simple finite dimensional modules, we need to talk about general weights and weight modules. So, as above, we assume that capital V is some finite dimensional SL2 module. For a complex number lambda, we denote by V lambda the set of all V in V, which are eigenvectors for H, with eigenvalue lambda. If this V lambda is non-zero, then lambda is called the weight of V. So a weight of V is an eigenvalue for the linear operator H acting on V. And the support of V is defined as a set of all weights. So this is a set of all complex numbers lambda, such that the corresponding V lambda is non-zero. In other words, one can say that the support of V is exactly the spectrum of the linear operator H. The module V is called a weight module if V is a direct sum of its weight spaces. Alternatively, one can say a module V is called a weight module if the action of H on V is diagonalizable. Here is a very useful claim about weight spaces. The claim is that the linear operator capital F maps V sub lambda to V sub lambda minus 2, and the linear operator E maps V sub lambda to V sub lambda plus 2. Proof. Consider the commutator relation that the commutator of H and F is equal to minus 2F. Using the fact that the commutator of H in F is HF minus FH, we can rewrite this equality into the equality HF is equal to F times H minus 2. So we can move H from the left to the right past F on the expense that we have to subtract 2. So now if V is an element in V lambda, then we want to compute what is the eigenvalue of H when applied to the element FV. In order to do that, we use this equality. We move H from the left to the right of F. The price which we need to pay is that we need to subtract 2. Now, H minus 2 acts on V as lambda minus 2 times V because V is a weight vector of weight lambda. And so we obtain that H times FV is equal to lambda minus 2 times FV. In other words, that FV is an element from V lambda minus 2. Similarly, using the commutation relation that the commutator of H and E is equal to 2E, one proves that E maps the vector space V lambda to the vector space V lambda plus 2 for any lambda. The above claim has the following consequence. Given any finite dimensional module V, the direct sum of all weight spaces of V is a non-zero submodule of V. Indeed, this is obviously close with respect to H, because H acts as a scalar on each V lambda, so each V lambda is closed under H. F shifts V lambda by subtracting 2 from lambda, and E shifts V lambda by adding 2 to lambda. So this direct sum becomes invariant under the action of H, F, and E, and therefore is a submodule of V. In particular, each simple finite dimensional SL2 module is a weight module, because each simple finite dimensional SL2 module must have at least one eigenvector for H, because we are working over the complex numbers, and since it has at least one eigenvector for H, this direct sum of weight subspaces of V is a non-zero subspace, and it's also a submodule, so it must coincide with V by simplicity. Therefore, each simple finite dimensional module is, in fact, a weight. So now we are in position to formulate and prove the classification theorem 
for simple finite dimensional SL2 modules. So the statement of the theorem is as follows. Let V be a simple finite dimensional SL2 module. Then there is a unique non-negative integer n such that V is isomorphic to the module V upper n as constructed a couple of slides ago. Again, there are two statements to prove here. First of all, that each V is isomorphic to one of the VNs, and the second statement that each V is isomorphic to a unique VN. So the uniqueness claim is quite easy because as follows directly from the construction, if k and n are different non-negative integers, then the corresponding modules vk and vn are not isomorphic for the simple reason that they have different dimensions. The dimension of vk is k plus 1, and the dimension of vn is n plus 1. This is an easy part. The difficult part is to prove existence. So we need to show that if we have a simple finite dimensional SL2 module V, then it is isomorphic to one of the VNs. By the previous slide, we know that a simple finite dimensional SL2 module must be a weight module. So we can fix a weight lambda of V with the property that the real part of this weight is maximal possible. We can do that because V is a finite dimensional module, so it only has finitely many weights. So among all the weights, we choose the one with the maximal possible real part. And we fix a non-zero element V of weight lambda. Then automatically, this V is killed by E. Why? Because in the previous slide, we saw that E maps V lambda to V lambda plus two, but lambda has the maximal possible real part as an eigenvalue, which means that lambda plus two cannot be a weight of the module V, which means that EV must be zero. So this is the first property, which we derive directly from our assumption of the maximality of the real part of lambda. So denote by W, the subspace of V spent by all elements of the form f to the power i applied to V, where i is a non-negative integer. Note that all non-zero elements of this form are automatically linearly independent because they are weight elements, so they are eigenvectors for H with different eigenvalues. V has eigenvalue lambda, F V has eigenvalue lambda minus two, F square V has eigenvalue lambda minus four, and so on. So the module V is finite dimensional, we have only finitely many non-zero elements of this form, but those which are non-zero are automatically linearly independent. The claim is that W is actually a submodule of V. In particular, this means that it must coincide with V because we assumed V to be a simple module, so it cannot have non-zero submodules. How to see this? In reality, we only need to show that W is stable with respect to the action of E. Indeed, by definition, W is stable with respect to the action of F, and we already observed that each generating element of W is an eigenvector of H which means that W is stable under the action of H. So the only remaining thing to check to prove that W is a submodule of V is to check that W is stable with respect to the action of E. Let us prove by induction on I that E applied to each element of the form F to the power I V is an element of W. If I is equal to zero, this is clear because we have already seen that E V is equal to zero. If I is greater than zero, then we use the commutation relation that the commutator of E and F is equal to H. So we can rewrite e times f to the power i v as a sum of two summons. The second summon is h times f to the power i minus 1 v is clearly in w because we already established that w is stable under the action of h and f to the power i minus 1. The first summon is f times e times f to the power i minus 1 v. So here e times f to the power i minus 1 v is in w by the inductive assumption and then applying f we stay in w. So this completes the proof. So w is really a submodule of v and in particular w must be equal to v because of the simplicity of v. And in particular the elements f to the power i v, those of these elements which are non-zero, must form a basis of v. So they generate v and they are linearly independent as we already established. Now we are in position to complete the proof of the classification theorem. We start with the following observation. So assume that we look at the three elements 
f to the power i minus 1v, f to the power iv, and f to the power i plus 1v, that they all are non-zero. And uh, we look how e, f, and h act at this L. F acts clearly as indicated with coefficient 1, directly by definition. All these elements are weight elements for h, in particular f to the power iv is an eigenvector for h with eigenvalue lambda minus 2i, denoted by mu here. The element e necessarily moves the element fi v to a scalar multiple of the element f i minus 1 v, and assume that we know the scalar ai for this action. Then we also have that the element e maps the element f i plus 1 v to a scalar multiple of ai v, and now the claim is that the corresponding scalar ai plus 1 is uniquely determined. To see this, we can simply evaluate the commutation relation ef minus fe is equal to h at the vector f to the power i applied to v. Then we will have that h of this vector is mu, ef gives us a i plus 1, and fe gives us a i. So we can compute a i plus 1 in terms of mu and a i. This observation has the following consequence. If we can prove that our weight, lambda, defined in the previous slide, is an negative integer, then it follows directly that our module v is isomorphic to the module v lambda, which was constructed a couple of slides ago. Why is this the case? So this observation basically says that if you move from right to left, there is a unique way to define an SL2 module structure on concatenation of such pictures. When n was a non-negative integer, we defined our module Vn as an SL2 structure on concatenation of such pictures. This observation says that there is only one way to do this. So if the weight lambda coincides with one of those n's, then V must be isomorphic to V. So how can we prove that lambda is a negative integer? The first step in doing this is just to check by induction that in this picture, the scalar ai is actually equal to i times lambda minus i times i minus 1. So a0 is equal to 0, a1 is equal to lambda, and so on. And the next step, since our module v is finite dimensional, sum fi of v must be zero. So it means that the corresponding ai also must be zero, which means that for some minimal i greater than zero, this expression must be zero. And this means that lambda is equal to i minus one, which is a non-negative integer. So this completes the proof of the classification theorem. In order to discuss the complete reducibility theorem, we need to talk about the Casimir element. The Casimir element on a finite dimensional SL2 module V is a linear operator on V defined using the following expression. So this is just a linear operator defined as h plus 1 squared plus 4f claim. The Casimir element can also be written as h minus 1 squared plus 4 ef, and it commutes with f, h, and e. So there are two things to check here, that the Casimir element has this alternative expression, and that it commutes with all generators of our Lie algebra. The first claim is easy, because the difference between these two expressions for C reduces to the following equality. 4EF is equal to 4FE plus 4H. And this is just a rewrite of the commutation relations that the commutator of E and F is equal to H. So this gives us the second expression for the Casimir element. So it remains to prove that C commutes with F, H, and E. In order to check that C commutes with H, we observe that H clearly commutes with any polynomial in H, so it commutes with the first summand in the expression of C. So what we really need to do, we really need to check that H commutes with EF or FE. To commute H with EF, we also recall that we can move H past E or past F on the expense of adding or subtracting 2. So when we start with H E F, we move H to the left past E, we have to add 2. Then we move H plus 2 to the left past F, we need to subtract 2, and we get our H back. So this proves that H commutes with E F, in particular that it commutes with C. It remains to prove that C commutes with F 
and with E, so we prove that it commutes with E, and the proof that it commutes with F is similar. So the computation to prove that E commutes with C is as follows. So let's try to compute E times C. We use the first expression for C. Let's try to compute E times C using the first expression for C. So it's E times H plus 1 squared plus 4 F E. We multiplied E inside the bracket, and we have E times H plus 1 squared plus 4 E F E. Again, when we compute E past H, the expense is that we should subtract 2 from H. So h plus 1 becomes h minus 1. We don't do anything in the second summand, but now we observe that the second summand has e on the right. So we can now move e outside of the bracket on the right-hand side, and inside the bracket we get exactly the second expression for c. And so ec is equal to c. So this completes the proof of the statement that our Casimir element commutes with f, h, and e. And directly from the definition, it is very easy to check that the Casimir element C acts on the module Vn, which was constructed before as a scalar n plus 1 squared. So C commutes with the action of the Lie algebra, so it must act on a simple module as a scalar by Schuss lemma. And in order to compute the scalar, we can apply C to an arbitrary element of the module. So if we apply it to Vn and use the first expression for C, then the sum on 4Fe kills Vn because E kills Vn, so we forget this. And the sum on h plus 1 squared results to the eigenvalue for h plus 1 squared, and Vn has eigenvalue n. So we get the expression n plus 1 squared. So the Casimir element C acts on Vn as a scalar n plus 1 squared. So now we can formulate our complete reducibility theorem. Each finite dimensional SL2 module is semi-simple, that is, it is isomorphic to a direct sum of simple modules. So how can we prove this result? We already know the classification theorem, which says that simple finite dimensional SL2 modules are exactly the SL2 modules Vn constructed in the previous slides. So in order to prove that each finite dimensional SL2 module is semi-simple, we need to prove that there are no extensions between the simple finite dimensional modules which we construct. In other words, we need to prove that each short exact sequence of this form, where we have Vn as a submodule of M with a quotient Vk, splits. So this is what we need to prove. Here we have two cases. The easy case is the case where n and k are different. So in this case, we can use the Casimir element constructed in the previous slide and establish that the action of this element splits the sequence. The Casimir element C acts as a scalar n plus 1 squared on the module Vn and as a scalar k plus 1 squared on the module vk. So if n is different from k, then n plus 1 squared is different from k plus 1 squared. So in particular, the action of c on m is diagonalizable and is a direct sum of two eigenspaces, one for the eigenvalue k plus 1 squared and one for the eigenvalue n plus 1 squared. Of course, Vn is a submodule of m, but then we can consider the eigenspace for c in m with eigenvalue k plus 1 squared. It must be a submodule as well, because c commutes with the action of SL2. So the eigenspace of c with eigenvalue k plus 1 squared must be a submodule for SL2 in M. And this submodule splits the sequence because then we can construct a map from VK to M by mapping VK to this submodule. So the case where N and K are different is fairly easy using the Casimir element. So the case where N is equal to K is more complicated, but we will also use the Casimir element even in this case. If we look carefully at the proof at our classification theorem, it is enough to prove 
that m is a weight module. So if n is equal to k, then n is the highest possible weight appearing in m. And if m is a weight module, we can choose two different linearly independent elements of that weight and use them to construct two different non-intersecting submodules in m, which will also split this short exact sequence. So the real challenge in this case is to prove that m is a weight module. To prove that m is a weight module, we need to analyze the situation when m is not a weight module and get some contradiction. In order to be able to analyze the situation when m is not a weight module, we need some extra notation. So we know that h acts diagonalizably on vn and on vk. But then since m is an extension of the two, in reality, h might not be diagonalizable on m. So it is possible that the action of h on m is given by Jordan cells of dimension at most two. So we have to account for this situation. So for a complex number mu, we denote by m upper mu, the set of all elements in m, which are killed by the second power of the operator h minus mu. Then, since we know that the size of the Jordan cell for h appearing in mu is at most two, we can write m as a direct sum of the subspaces m upper mu over all mu complex numbers. So let us denote by c mu and h mu the restrictions of the action of c and h on m mu respectively. So the restriction of the action of h to m mu comes directly from the definition. m mu is a generalized root subspace for h with eigenvalue mu. So h, of course, preserves m mu. c preserves m mu because c commutes with h. A linear operator which commutes with h must preserve all root subspaces. This is a basic linear algebra statement. So the operators c mu and h mu are well defined. Also note that we have the two different expressions for the Casimir element. For the highest possible weight which we have, which is n, we can use the first expression and concludes that Cn is equal to Hn plus 1 squared. There should be also plus 4Fe here, but it acts as 0 on the weight n because there is no weight n plus 2. For the lowest possible weight minus n, we can use the second expression where we also have plus 4 E f. This is the lowest possible weight. There is no weight minus n minus 2, so the second part disappears. So we have the expressions that c sub minus n is equal to h sub minus n minus 1 squared. And now we want to play these two expressions against each other to get the fact that the action of h must be semi-simple. Let's observe that the linear operator a, which is given by the nth power of f, is an invertible operator from the nth root space to minus nth root space. This is because a sends a non-zero vector of weight n to the vector f to the power n v, which is a non-zero vector of weight minus n. And this is true for the module v upper n and also for the module v upper k because k is equal to n. So this is true for n as well. And now let us compute. So hn plus 1 squared, this is equal to cn. This is one of the ways to write the Casimir operator when restricted to the weight n. Now I multiply cn on the left with a inverse times a. This is doing nothing. This is a Casimir element, so it commutes with the action of f, so I can move it over via a in the middle, but this changes the weight. So, and a changes the weight from n to minus n. So I get c minus n in the middle. And for c minus n, we have the second expression, which was h minus n minus one squared. So this is just the second expression for the Casimir. And now I again move away h minus n minus 1 squared through a to the right and use that any time I move h past f, I need to pay a price of minus 2. So a consists of f n times, so the price I pay is minus 2n. At the end, now we remove a inverse a, we get the equality that h n plus 1 squared must be equal to h n minus 1 minus 2n squared. Simplifying this expression, the most important part we see is that the 
hn squared clearly disappears. So when we simplify this expression, we get hn is equal to n, which means that the action of hn on mn is scalar, in particular diagonalizable. There are no Jordan cells. And this is exactly what we needed to prove. So it follows that M is a weight module, and hence our short exact sequence splits, which completes the proof of the complete reducibility statement. Finally, let us talk a little bit about combinatorics of tensor product of simple SL2 modules. We start with the following observation. If M and N are weight SL2 modules, then the tensor product of these modules is again a weight module. Moreover, the support of the tensor product is equal to the sum of the supports of the factors. So this follows if we just apply the formula which was used to define the tensor the product of G modules for the particular element H. So assume that we have an element V in M, which is an eigenvector for H with eigenvalue lambda, and assume that we have an element W in N, which is an eigenvector for H with eigenvalue mu. Then, applying H to V tensor W, we can use the formula of how the algebra G acts on the tensor product. We act on the first component, tensor the second one, plus the first component, tensor the action of the second component. So HV is lambda V, HW is mu W, so we have the first factor with lambda, the second with mu, and then we move out V tensor W and get that H applied to V tensor W is lambda plus mu V tensor W. As a consequence, we have that the support behaves additively under the tensor product, and in fact, we can generalize this argument to supports taken with multiplicity. So this is also known as characters of weight mode. An easy consequence of this computation is the following, that if you take the simple finite dimensional module Vn, which we constructed, and tensor it with a simple finite dimensional module V1, then the outcome is as follows. So V1 is a simple two-dimensional module with weights 1 and minus 1. So we have Vn, it has highest weight n, this one has highest weight 1, so if we add them up we will get n plus 1. So there is a special case of course if n is equal to 0, if n is a one-dimensional module then it does nothing and we just get our V1 back. But if n is greater than 0 then in this tensor product the highest weight appearing will be n plus 1. So we must have a copy of Vn plus 1 in the tensor product. And if you look at the dimensions of the weight spaces appearing here, here everything is one-dimensional. We shift it one to the right and we shift it one to the left and add up. There will be a bunch of two-dimensional weight spaces starting from n minus 1. This means that V1, tensor Vn, is isomorphic to Vn plus 1, direct sum with Vn minus 1 for each n greater than 0. Using this, we in particular see that each simple finite dimensional module appears in a tensor power of V1. So if we take V1 tensor V1, we get V2. If we tensor V2 with V1, we get V3, and so on. So using this and induction, one can check that we have the following formula for the tensor product of two simple finite dimensional SL2 modules. If we tensor Vk and Vn, for arbitrary k and n, then of course the maximal weight which appears here is k plus n, so it must have a copy of vk plus n inside, and then we have to decrease weights by 2, so the next one will be vk plus n minus 2, and so on, and then the smallest one appearing in this decomposition will be v with index the absolute value of the difference between k and n. So this last formula has a nice combinatorial interpretation, which we will now show. Let's consider the example V2 tensor V3. Because of that formula, the highest weight which appears is 2 plus 3, 5, and then we subtract by 2, and we should go all the way down to the absolute value between that difference, which is 1. So V2 tensor V3 is isomorphic to V5 plus V3 plus V1. So here is an illustration of this. So V2 is a three-dimensional module, so this is the cone of this diagram, and V3 is a four-dimensional module, so this is the row of the diagram. So when we take the tensor product, we get a module of dimension 3 times 4, which is 12, so we, we get this rectangle. And now the module V5, it's a six-dimensional module, which can be seen in this picture 
at the pass from the northwest vertex in this rectangular to the southeast vertex. So it has one, two, three, four, five, six, length six. So this is our module V5, the blue module, that's for V5. And now if we take it away, we have a smaller rectangle where we now have the next pass has length four. So we, we removed one row and one column. So altogether, the dimension drops by two. So the next longest pass has length four, and it corresponds to V3. And again, if we remove it in what is left, we have a rectangle, well, one row, two columns, the longest pass is length two, it corresponds to V1. And this is a general picture. If you have VK and VN, we write K plus one columns here, N plus one columns here, and the summons appearing in the decomposition can be obtained using this step-by-step -step longest passes from northwest to southeast in the rectangles. So this is a combinatorial interpretation of the tensor product formula for simple finite dimensional SFB modules. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed the lecture.